Good morning and welcome to Marvin Nye Methodist Church's Sanctuary Service. Due to the coronavirus, you might notice that things are a little different this morning. The pews are empty, as is the choir loft, as we have heeded the President's National Emergency Declaration and the request of our medical professionals from the community to work to eliminate large gatherings of people while practicing social distancing. Our goal, along with other churches in the community, is to drastically reduce the spread of the COVID-19 virus. As we continue to broadcast on television each Sunday at 10.30 a.m., please know that both the entire traditional and contemporary worship services are live streamed on your computer starting at 11 a.m. You may go to our website, marvinumc.com, or our Facebook pages to find them. We join you in prayer for our community and its health. God bless you and your family. Let's join in. The message is already underway. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My wife, Jeannie, and I uh, lived in Southern California while I attended seminary. And one morning, it was actually October 1st, 1987, there was a 5.9 earthquake that shook us out of bed. The Whittier Narrows earthquake was, had its epicenter just 13 miles from my seminary apartment. I had never been in an earthquake before, and that's not the way you want to start your morning. But friends, I remember just the shaking, the loud noise of that, things falling in our apartment to the floor. It was kind of a terrifying event, having never gone through that before. But one of the things I didn't realize after experiencing that earthquake for the very first time, I'd never been in one, was that there are aftershocks. And sure enough, it wasn't just but a few hours later, the first aftershock hit. And then after that, I began to realize that as the, uh, the, the earth began to shifting those plates and to begin to settle back in, there would be multiple aftershocks that would occur. In fact, three days later, there was a 5.1 earthquake aftershock that shook us again, very close to that same epicenter. Again, it was frightening. And I just remember for about two weeks or more, just being a little bit on edge not knowing when to stand in a doorway or where would I be when the next aftershock hit. And I wonder if the disciples were in that same predicament after resurrection day, after Jesus had appeared alive to them and uh, they knew that there would be other moments. In fact, the scriptures tell us of 40 days when Jesus would make appearances all around the region, even into Galilee even to as many as 500 people. These are what I would call Easter aftershocks. And that is what this sermon series that we're beginning today, which will take us in through the rest of May, is all about. I will share with you these Easter aftershocks because they are important for Jesus to fulfill his ministry and the purpose of his coming to earth to redeem the world. There were doubts that needed to be worked through. There was peace that needed to be restored to the disciples. And the one who denied Christ needed to be reinstated and recalled to follow him. There would be a meal that would be shared with the disciples. There would be further instruction and the promise that the Holy Spirit would be coming and they would be given the ministry of forgiveness. And of course, the disciples would be commissioned to go out into all the world to take the message which Jesus had begun of his redeeming death for us and the forgiveness of sins to all the known world. And Jesus would do this through public appearances with his disciples, with his believers. And they were Easter aftershocks and they were very strategic. 
So during the season of Eastertide, we began this sermon series. And maybe, just maybe, before the series ends, we'll be able to be gathered again in this beautiful sanctuary. It will be our own Marvin Easter aftershock. Today's aftershock appearance involves the disciple Thomas. His nickname, as many of us know, Doubting Thomas, because of the scripture that I've just read today. On Resurrection Sunday that evening, the disciples were gathered behind locked doors, still afraid, still trying to sort out all these things, like the puzzle pieces that uh, Sarah shared, trying to put it us all together, make sense out of this, when all of a sudden Jesus stood in their midst, and Jesus said, peace be with you. Thomas was not present. Some scholars speculate that maybe Thomas had kind of pulled away by himself. Maybe he was skeptical. Maybe he was hearing uh, reports and he was not sure that he wanted to be with the disciples. I don't think that's true. I think that Thomas may have been simply out trying to get some supper for the disciples that night. And he happened to leave at an inappropriate time. He missed, in the unfortunate timing, one of Jesus' appearances. We're not surprised that when Thomas appears that the disciples all say, he's been here, he's alive, we have seen the Lord. What is kind of shocking is Thomas' response. Unless I see the nail prints in his hand, unless I'm able to put my finger in them, if it, unless I could see that wound on his side and, and put my hand in there, I will not believe. The amazing thing is how did he know that information? The disciples had told him that they knew it was Jesus because they had seen the very marks of his suffering even on his resurrected body. Thomas, though, is still very skeptical. And I just wonder about this. I mean, he'd been with Jesus and he'd been with those same disciples for three years. And he's hearing reports from women and others that Jesus is alive and yet he's skeptical and he doesn't want to believe. The Apostle John, who wrote this gospel account, uses the name Didymus, which means twin. Now, today, we celebrate twins. In fact, uh, Cooper and Cameron Smith, if you're watching this, a little shout out to you. You're some of my favorite twins in this congregation. They serve as acolytes at the 830 service most every Sunday. But you know, twins in the days of biblical times were not thought of as favorable as or celebrated like we would celebrate Cooper and Cameron in our lives. They were seen more as kind of a threat or a strange omen. Two children coming at one, who would be the firstborn? Who would get the inheritance? And then oftentimes you would often hear of complications in the birth, one of the twins not maybe surviving or maybe causing the life of the mother. And so twins was not as favorable at that time as we would think. But that's really not the point here. The point is in the Greek, the word doubt and the word to are very similar. Somewhat like double and doubt are very similar in English. Doubt is to have two minds, if you will. The Chinese speak of doubt as having a foot in two different boats. We know that that could be a problem. James 1, 5 through 8 says uh, of of doubt, the doubting person is like uh, the person who's tossed by the waves one way, and then the, the water shifts another way, and then they're over here. Earlier in John's gospel, we, we hear reports of Thomas's words. When Jesus is uh, hearing reports of Lazarus is, is dying and he wants to go and heal him, he wants to be with them and with Mary and uh, Martha. And uh, Jesus is starting to talk about going to Bethany and the disciples, according to John 11, start to say, you know, Jesus, I don't think that's a good idea. Things are getting a little bit heated up and and, uh, going to Jerusalem may cost you your life. I think maybe we should just avoid Bethany. I think it's interesting. That's what the disciples are saying. But Thomas says, let's all go and die with Jesus. Now, at first I thought, what a brave, courageous statement. But then I thought about it. Jesus is thinking, I want to go back and be with my friend and bring him back to health and bring him back to life. I want to be there for Mary and Martha. And what is Thomas thinking? We're all going to die. Thomas has his doubts. But what I want to lift up today is the very fact that he's included in the gospel record. 
The gospel does not have a clean package of, oh, Jesus is resurrected, and all of a sudden everybody's on board, everybody's got the same story, everybody's believing. The very fact that Thomas is there with his doubts should be an encouragement to many of us because, seriously, the human condition, oftentimes people have doubts. Skepticism and doubts should be played out, should be worked out in the Christian community. And that's one of the first things I want to share with you if you're taking some notes this morning. Let me remind you that the scripture states that a whole week passes before Jesus would make his appearance with Thomas in the room. A whole week. I mean, if Jesus is so worried about the fact that Thomas has doubts, you would think he would immediately come back and, and when Thomas was in the room and shored things up. But the fact that Jesus waits an entire week to come, I think that means that Jesus is okay to let people have some doubts. Jesus is not threatened by that. He allows us to have questions. And I want to show even in, the, in this sermon today that Jesus at times struggled himself, maybe in the Garden of Gethsemane. During that week, the other 10 disciples, I wonder while they waited for Jesus' second aftershock to happen, did they try to convince uh, Thomas to believe? Or did they give him some space? So church, sometimes we have to allow people to be working through some difficulty, working through some struggles, some doubts, and allow them to just be in our space and, and not push them out, not tell them that uh, they shouldn't be here unless they can firmly believe. I wonder if any of the disciples were tempted by guilt to persuade Thomas. Hey, come on, Thomas. We're your friends. Don't you trust us? Do you think we're actually lying to you about Jesus appearing? Why are you being such a stickler about this? Why can't you believe like us? The scriptures don't speak of anything like that. Or what about fear tactics? Man, I don't want to be you when Jesus comes back because, man, you don't believe him? I just, and you're saying you want to touch him? Come on, really? I mean, none of us want to be poked like that. And you don't trust Jesus? You don't trust us? Man, I'd be afraid for you. No, there's no discussion about that. They simply allow Thomas to struggle and have his doubts for an entire week. So if you've ever found yourself with skepticism, it's okay. If you've ever had doubts in the faith, it's going to be all right. Stay connected to the community. Stay connected to God's people. And let the faith and the encouragement of others be an encouragement to you. Michael Novak, in his book, Belief and Unbelief, states that doubt is not so much a dividing line that separates us into two different camps as it is a razor's edge that runs through every soul. As I was preparing for this message, and I was reading about doubt and Christian doubt and people who have had struggles with faith, I found that many of the stories come from deep tragedies, heartaches, loss of life of loved ones, huge tragedies, Holocaust survivors, all these incidents that really shake up a person's faith that God is in control, that God is good, and sometimes theology may need to be a little bit adjusted. But as I read these, I found that those who stayed with the Christian community really came out the best on the other end. The great reformer, I was shocked to read the story about Martin Luther, was asked one time to help a woman with her doubts of faith. Tell me, Martin Luther said, when you recite the creeds, do you really believe them? Yes, most certainly, she said. Then go in peace. You believe even better than I do. Even the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, had moments, if you read his journals, when he questioned his very own salvation and uh, with his assurance of his faith in God. Great leaders of the church, like Catholic theologian Henry Nouwen, Mother Teresa, oftentimes were questioning their faith. Mother Teresa, in a personal letter, stated to a friend that was going through a hard time, Jesus has a very special love for you. But as for me, she said of herself, the silence and the emptiness is so great that I look and I do not see. And I listen, but oftentimes I do not hear. This came from Mother Teresa's book, Come, Be My Light. A person who did such great work, such ministry for the Lord, 
having doubts sometimes in her faith. But what did all these individuals I've cited have in common? They stayed in the community. They didn't walk away. They didn't chunk their faith. They didn't chunk God. They stayed with the religious folk, and they, they continued to work out their salvation. I came across a great song this week. Actually, Gina told me it on Friday. It's called Lift Up Your Hands When You Can't. The story, the song is inspired about a story of a couple uh, whose baby died just three days after the child was born. Their only act of faith was to show up at church on Sunday. That's all they could do, was to show up at church on Sunday. And as the worship service began, the people stood and began to sing their praises to the Lord. This couple just couldn't stand. They couldn't get up out of their seats. They couldn't lift their voices in praise to God. And suddenly they felt the hands of those who stood behind them on their shoulders. And as the pastors watched this, they showed that, or they saw that the, the whole church began to be connected. People placing their hands on the shoulder and the person in front of them, connecting all the way to the couple who was up near the front where they usually sat in church. The man standing next to the father leaned over and said, I'm going to sing for you today. What a great word. What a great offer of encouragement to say, I know it's hard. You can't offer praise to the Lord today, but I am going to sing for you today. Schultz wrote these words that became the song. Well, I know that your heart is past broken and it feels like you've got nothing left and you can't find your song because you can't even speak. You're just trying to take the next breath. And you find yourself here in this moment where you have all where we've all gathered to praise. And though you wish that you did, you've got nothing to give. It's enough that you're here anyway. So let me stand up and sing of his goodness. Let me lift up a song in your place. Because I know that he'll always be with us even when we can't see his face. I'm going to sing to the one who is faithful, though the battle is not over yet. I'll be your voice till you're able. I'll lift up your hands when you can't. The song goes on, one day I will walk through the shadows, too weary and worn out to stand, and I'm going to need you beside me to lift up this song once again. Friends, there will, all be, there will always be a time when someone needs to sing for you, and I think that's one of the important things that uh, I wanted to lift out of this message today, is that in the midst of struggle, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of a, a crisis of faith, we have others who surround us and who believe for us and with us, even maybe if we can't. I was reminded this week of the great theologian, the great apologist, C.S. Lewis. I had forgotten his story. C.S. Lewis' mother died when he was nine years of age. His father was so distraught, so disengaged, that he sent his brother and himself off to a boarding school where they would be beaten and they would be abused. And through these harsh realities, any sense of a good God, any sense of faith at all for these young men was lost. And at age 17, C.S. Lewis said to one of his Christian friends, I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof of any of them. And he would move into adulthood. He would go into a difficult season in his life where he would make no application of faith. He simply walked away from it and spent a lot of his life disbelieving faith, especially the Christian faith. But then he came into conversation with J.R. Tolkien at age 31. As a result of those conversations, C.S. Lewis became a believer. And in his book, Surprised by Joy, he describes Christ as coming to him unrelentlessly and he did everything he could to resist even meeting Jesus. But then he finally admitted, I gave up. And I said that God is God. I knelt and prayed. I described myself as the most dejected, most reluctant convert in all of England. But then he concluded as he continued to grow in faith, the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men. God's compulsion is our liberation. 
C.S. Lewis was a wounded person. And there are many wounded individuals in our world today, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's other circumstances or the death of a loved one or a difficult diagnosis. There are many whose sometimes faith gets rocked by their circumstances. And I just wanna encourage you today to stay connected to the Christian community. Stay connected to God, hang in there and work things out. I'm so thankful that Thomas stayed with the disciples and the disciples stayed with him. The second thing I wanna lift out today is this aftershock of Easter. Truly is the aftershock of Easter, the fact that Jesus just appeared again with Thomas in the room, I think the true aftershock are the words of Thomas and the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. As Jesus appears, he again says, peace be with you, and he immediately engages Thomas. Thomas, I'm here. If you'd like, put your finger right here in the nail prints. If you want to, put your hand right here in my side. Stop doubting, Thomas, and believe. And the amazing thing is, are the words that come from Thomas's mouth. My Lord and my God. I believe, friends, that is truly the aftershock of John's gospel. Do you remember how John's gospel begins? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or the Word was with God. Excuse me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So by the time we get to chapter 20, and we hear the confession from the one who's been doubting, it is like this huge aftershock. This is the Word, the Word who is the Lord and who is God. The statement is something that should resonate with all of us. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So everybody who follows Jesus, everyone who calls himself a Christian believer, has made the declaration with their lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, and they have believed that he has been raised from the dead. We hold that in common with Thomas today and all the disciples who've gone before us. So in the midst of struggle, I want to encourage you to hold on to those words. Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is God. You can be honest with God and say, God, right now it's difficult for me to believe. It's difficult difficult for me to hold on to some of the doubts that I have, but I still believe that you are Lord and you are Lord of my life. I still believe you are God, even though I struggle right now. And before closing, though, I think I must do justice to the words, a command and a promise from Jesus. Those words are, stop doubting and believe, and blessed are those who have not yet believed. Why does Jesus want us to move from doubt to belief? Because friends, doubt is a part of the process, but it is not the ending. In the words of Leslie Newbigin in his book, Proper Confidence, he states this, doubt is useful for a while. Even Christ doubted in the Garden of Gethsemane when he struggled, Lord, is it possible that this cup could be taken from me? But we must move on. To choose doubt as a philosophy of life is like choosing immobility as a means of transportation. What is Newbegin saying? We are called to move on and let doubt do its good work to help us grow, to help us learn, to make us hungry for truth, to press through it, not to let it hold us up and get us stuck. And therefore, as we get stuck, it becomes the philosophy of life. Well, I just don't want to believe that, and I don't care about that, and I gave up on that long ago. And those are some of the things that people say, and in so doing, they miss out on truly finding the peace that God can bring to our lives. I believe that we all have doubts, but I don't believe that doubt is a good, uh, excuse me, that doubt is a good, uh, is a, doubt is a good servant of faith but doubt is not a good master of faith. In this community, Jesus calls us to work through, to press on until we find the faith and to hold on to that belief that we made as we professed our faith in Christ that Jesus is Lord and God. 
And friends, I want to close uh, this sermon with a kind of a, an illustration that I uh, uh, learned um, uh, just the last two days. Um, I want to just remind you that it looks like it's going to be raining pretty hard today. We may have some tornadic activity around us, some severe weather, but you recall that last Sunday, Easter morning, we all awoken to uh, tornado sirens and there was heavy rains that were hitting our homes and many of us hidden, got hidden in closets for safety. And I just remind you, what happens that creates that is oftentimes the cold air of a cold front getting caught up and, and, and crashing into the warmth air, that gulf moisture, creating this, this spin and all this activity and these thunderstorms. And I think that that's kind of like what happens when faith collides with doubt. Usually there is some kind of a storm involved. Last week, I watched as the hard rain just poured over the gutters of my house, and it just knocked all the, the mulch out of one of our flower beds. I realized what the problem was. The gutters, friends, were full of leaves. The gutters were full of pollen tassels from the live oak catkins that came off the live oaks that had shed their leaves just weeks before as a part of the spring growth. So Friday, I got outside and I began to empty out those gutters of all the debris. And I tell you, sometimes I think I'm like a monk. I don't want to be a monk. don't want to live in a monastery. I like being married. I like having a home. I don't want to live with a bunch of guys. But I'm like a monk in this. I do menial tasks, I do yard work, and the Lord sometimes gives me ideas and analogies and speaks to me. So I share with you what I learned the last two days, working out, cleaning out gutters in my yard. I found that the backyard, because of this huge live oak tree, the, 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 the gutters were full of leaves. And because of that, there was this running over of water. Not only was, as I cleaned out the gutters, I realized that the gutters were also stained badly. Just talking about sometimes people have so much debris in their life. They're like gutters that get clogged up. And so when water hits, it just kind of rushes over them and their lives end up being stained. The gutters allow the water to be placed where it needs to go so that there can be flow and there can be movement in our lives. But the leaves in the gutters just jam things up and then the staining begins. And I think so many lives are like that, that have given up on God. Their lives are just kind of stuck. And all the pain and agony begins to appear in their lives rather than the water to flow and to be properly dealt with and for the life to go on. So that's what I want to encourage you with that analogy today. And that would be my prayer for anyone who's struggling with doubt, anyone who wants to give up on God or walk away from the church. God needs you in the church. He needs you to be in a life of community of faith and faith stories. He needs you to be around those who believe. And he needs you to hold on to that profession that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. And he wants to move you towards belief. For that is where you will truly find your joy. Because friends, as you move towards belief and move away from doubt, I believe you can anticipate an Easter aftershock. Amen.